Hello. Like Grand Moff Tarkin and Darth Vader, each being too polite to take the last donut at the annual Imperial Christmas party, this is the Discriminating Gamer. Ladies and gentlemen, speaking of the Empire, I want to talk to you today all about one of the meanest games you will ever play, Dominaire from AEG. In Dominair from AEG, two to six players attempt to control the city-state of Tempest. They attempt to dominate it by utilizing a conspiracy, which can then spread its influence to the various subsections of the city-state. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is part of the Tempest series of games from uh, AEG. Now, you will recall on Season 1, Episode 4 of The Discriminating Gamer, Justin and I reviewed Courtier. Now, Courtier, or Courtier, as I like to call it, uh, is a fantastic game um, that is uh, the, the first game in this series that, of course, it also encompasses the Love Letter game. Um, but Courtier is very fun area control where you're trying to influence the, the queen and the royal court. Now, Dominaire takes the same iconography, the same, some of the same artwork, the same kind of aesthetic, and places it um, kind of in the larger setting of trying to control the city-state itself. Now, you have various districts. You have, of course, the church, you have the senate, you have the warrens, you have the kind of the mercantile area, um, the canals themselves. These are all places around the board where you can attempt to spread your influence. You've also got within each of these districts different blocks. Some of them have kind of plus uh, one victory point or more victory points. Some of them have negative victory points. But you've got all the different blocks, and it's in here you are going to attempt to, as I say, once again, spread your influence. Now, the game takes place over the course of seven seasons, and each season has a specific number of things you do. First thing you're going to do is select agent cards. You're going to be dealt a certain number of agent cards. You keep, I believe, three, and then you return the rest to the, uh, the, to the deck. And then you look at your agents and decide which one of these you want to use uh, at the beginning of the game. Over the course of the game, you're going to create a tableau of seven cards, one for each season. Now, these are your conspirators, and your conspirators, of course, are going to attempt to, as I say, uh, help you in your in your conspiracy to take over the city-state, but they're going to come with various advantages and some important disadvantages as well. Now, on the card, you're going to have kind of how much influence they get, how much gold they get, how much money they get, and they're also going to have uh, various abilities that they can do when they are placed in the correct spots. They're also going to have an exposure rating, which is very important. So what you're going to do is, at the beginning of the season, each of you reveal your uh, character, your agent, at the very beginning. Now, whoever has the highest exposure rating, uh, and you go ahead and you keep track of everybody's exposure on the exposure track, is then going to become the scapegoat. Essentially, the first player is going to have some very important and powerful things that he can do in the game, but if he stays in that position for too long, he will almost certainly lose. Now, your character, too, they have abilities with numbers on them. Now, those numbers trigger if they exist in that spot in your tableau. For instance, if you have a 1 and a 3, you place that person in the 1 spot, they can use the 1 ability. If you were to use that 1 and the 3 and place him in the 3 spot, he could use the 3 and the 1, because less is 1 is less than 3. If you placed him in the 2 spot, you could still only use the 1 ability. You can't use the 3 ability for the whole game. You can never use abilities that are higher than where they are on the spot, but you can always use ones that are that same number where they are on the spot or uh, in the tableau or if they are lower in the tableau. After you've selected your agents for the conspiracy phase, you then go to the event phase. Essentially, you draw an event card. Now, the event is going to trigger uh, certain things depending on which season it is, or it may trigger nothing at all. It'll go ahead and tell you to do specific things if it is that season. If not, you just ignore it. You will, however, see two, uh, two different icons. These represent different areas on the board. Again, the Senate, the Church, etc. And it's going to have to, uh, each one will have a number in it. Now, the scapegoat is going to make a decision. He can raise the value of one of those areas on the board and lower the, uh, another one. He can't raise both or lower both. He has to raise one and lower one. Now, this is important because off to the side of the board, you have a track that represents each of the districts on the board with essentially a point value. Uh, essentially, that's the score. At the end of the game, that's what holding that district is going to be worth, but it's also going to be important uh, for other things as well. So the scapegoat has tremendous power when it comes to deciding how much a particular district is worth at a particular time. Now, after you do the event phase, you have canvassing. So essentially what's going to happen here is players are going to collect their gold and their influence from their conspirator cards. You add up all the cards together and collect all the, uh, all the uh, 
influence they give you, all the coins they give you. You also have different classes of agents. So if you have two agents right next to each other that have a same class keyword, uh, they get an additional influence token. If you've got more than that, uh, it's not going to trigger. It's just going to be if, if they are adjacent once, you get an extra influence token. Now, these influence tokens are cubes, and essentially what you're going to do then is you are going to place, uh, in turn order from the scapegoat, scapegoat up, you are going to place your cubes all over the board. Now this is important and this too is where a place where not being first can help you because you can see what everybody else is doing and then you can counter them. You have the opportunity to counter them if you're going last. Essentially you can place cubes in any of the blocks around the board. As soon as you have cubes in a block, you are the controller of that faction. You get that faction's ability card uh, that you can use later. Um, but as soon as somebody else puts uh, controls an equal number of blocks, then nobody controls it. Whoever has the majority of blocks in a district controls that district. Now what you can do is you can put your cubes in any of the blocks, or you can actually on a one-for-one -one basis knock other players' cubes out. For instance, if somebody has two cubes in a block and I want it, I can put, commit three cubes to it, essentially destroying two of his and two of mine, and then I control it with one block, one cube. After you've gone around and placed your influence, then you essentially have two actions. And you'll each take one action, then you'll each take a second action. There are several different actions that you can take in the game. First thing you can do is use one of your agent's abilities. Again, depending on where it is in your tableau and what the number is next to the ability, you can use one of those agent's abilities. You can also use the district ability. Now again, you get the card for the district ability. If you control that district, you can use that specific ability as well. You can gain one crown from the bank, or you can spend crowns equal to the number of a district's point value to place a block, or place a cube, rather, on one of the blocks. So that way, if it's a really expensive district, if it's got a high victory point, it's going to cost you a lot of money to put one of your cubes uh, in that uh, district. Now, some game effects may cause you, or you may choose to, turn one of your agents upside down. Now, if he's upside down, you can't use him for anything, but you can do a rally action, which allows you to flip that guy so he is, once again, face up. You can recruit, essentially adding a, a, uh, uh, an agent to your hand. I think you look at the top two. You can pick one, put the other one back. Uh, you can also replace an agent that you've got in your tableau with another one from your hand. Finally, you can whitewash. Essentially, to whitewash, you, you pay a certain number of crowns, depending on factors on the board, that let you actually reduce your exposure. Uh, again, that's going to be very important. You don't want a high exposure when the end of the game comes around. So, as I say, you take two actions there, then you proceed to the next season. Again, the next season, you repeat these steps in process, the conspiracy phase, the event phase, the canvassy phase, and then the two actions. Now, in the very, uh, when you get to, I think, uh, turn three, at the end of the turn three, you do have a drafting uh, section where you can each start drafting uh, more cards. I think you draw eight cards, and then you get to keep, I think, five of them. Uh, so you can kind of, halfway through the game, get new agent cards to kind of see you through the rest of the game. Uh, you go ahead, you do that, you repeat the steps again, and then the very last season, Season 7, at the end you get to take three actions instead of the normal two. Now at the end of Season 7, you proceed to the scoring phase. Scoring is very interesting and very intricate in this game. Now essentially, you're going to control, whatever district you control, you get that victory point, whatever it's at at that time, you're going to get that number of victory points for your uh for your victory point total. You're also going to look at all the blocks you control that have positive and negative victory points to add that to your score. Then, of course, you may have some agents that have triggered some other um, point abilities. You take those and you factor them in as well. Now you've got your total score, but things still aren't done because now you look at that exposure track. All the agents that you played that were very powerful, that let you do all those abilities, the really powerful ones came with very high exposure ratings. Now, at the end of the game, if you have a high exposure rating, it's really going to hurt you. Now, if you have the lowest exposure point total, you lose no victory points. If you have the highest exposure point total, you lose uh, one victory point for every three exposure points you have on the board. Everybody else loses one point for every five exposure points they have on the board. So that can really hurt you if you are way out in front on that exposure track. Whoever has the most victory points at the end, after all that is completed, wins Dominaire. So Dominaire is a game that I have owned for years, and it's one that I finally, uh, I, I, I haven't played it in a while actually, and I finally played it again recently with uh, Zach and, and uh, Sean and Russ, we very old friends, we've all known each other for 20 years plus, golly, 30 years, and 
case of uh, Sean about. Anyway, we've known each other for years, and uh, so it was really exciting to um, get together, and, and I wanted to introduce this game to them, because none of them have played it, and I really loved it. Zach loves Courtier. Sean likes Courtier, too. Courtier is one of Zach's favorite games. Zach loves Courtier, and he was super excited to finally play Dominaire, and I was really excited to play it again, because I, spoiler alert, I love this game. I love this game. Let me tell you why I love it. Um, this game, as I say, is one of the meanest games you will ever play. Uh, it is brutal. It is absolutely brutal. It is unforgiving in a lot of respects. And it's a game where you can be way out in front one minute and just have the rug pulled out from underneath you. Case in point, this game that we played, this most recent game that we played, I was playing very low ex uh, exposure total, so my cards were not that powerful. I was hardly getting any influence at the beginning of the game. I was hardly getting any money at the beginning of the game. I was having money problems throughout that game. By contrast, Zach was playing very powerful cards with very high exposure ratings. Despite my warning, you don't want too high of exposure. He was kind of playing fast and loose with that. Consequently, he had a ton of money. He had a ton of, of cubes, influence cubes, and he was dominating most of that game. <laughs> Dominator. And it was very interesting. Now, by the end of the game, however, um, while he and Sean were battling, and Russ and I were battling a lot, but, but we're, we're battling with some of these other guys as well, um, because his exposure was so high, uh, he, like I said, he was in the lead for most of the game, uh, he actually lost. I think he came in dead last. I was at dead last for most of the game. I mean, I was way behind for most of the game, but because my exposure rating was so low, I actually came in second. Uh, I believe Sean came in first. Sean, was it Sean or Russ? One of them came in first, um, and, and they both played a good game, and they kind of found that middle road, and it worked for both of them. Um, so it, it, it's a game that you don't know until the end who's going to win. No matter how it looks, you don't know until the end who is exactly going to win. Now, as I say, this is mean. It's mean because this game and your abilities have these effects where, uh, you know, you, you, your, your, your opponents plan out a strategy, they try to take something, and then pretty easily you can just take it from them. You can place your blocks in a spot where they are located. You can place your blocks, you know, wherever, uh, your cubes, rather, in blocks in districts where they are on top, and you can take it from them. And it's, as I say, very, very, very brutal when that happens. It's just it's just a punishing game, and it's punishing. Uh, and it's fun. It's just so much fun. I, you know, you've, you've heard this from me before. I'm not a huge Euro game fan. Uh, I, I, I say that a lot. Now, I don't hate Euro games. Just as a general, as a genre, there's other, there are other games that are, I'd rather play good old-fashioned Dice Chucker. I love them. But this is a game that... This I'll just say it right now. This is my favorite Euro game. Dominaire is my favorite Euro game. I love it so much. And maybe it's because there is. It feels like there's direct conflict here. And a lot of Euro games feel like it's indirect conflict, competing for resources and what have you. And there's there, that's kind of here. But it's it, it's so direct. And it's you can just scream bloody murder at people. And there's not a lot of chance either. You know, there's there's some with the cards you draw, of course. When you screw someone over here, like I say, not a lot of chance. It's deliberate. You know it. They know it. It's, it's brutal. It is brutal. Um, I love Courtier. I think Courtier's a fantastic game, but this, to me, is so much more complex and so much more mean. And Courtier can be quite mean as well. But this one just takes it to the next level. Courtier's a pretty quick game. It's about, I think, 45 minutes to an hour. This game, you're looking at a two- to three-hour game, and with more people, it's more, and it's, and it's tough. I played this game, um, I think, with four and five players, I think. If I remember correctly, um, but I, I I think it 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 it's even more brutal with more players. It feels like the, the map is bigger. The map is double sided and, and it's and it's bigger. But it it seems to me as well too. It is a longer game, and I think it's great with four. I have no problem playing this as a four player. I think it's a lot of fun. I think it's fun too with with more players as well. So again, um, obviously. Uh, buy this game, buy it, buy it, buy it, buy it, buy it. It is so worth it. This is a game that I, I don't think ever got the love that it needed. And I think past Love Letter, I don't think the Tempest series of games ever got the love they really needed. Um, I'm going to tell you right now, again, my recommendation for Courtier Stands, go out, buy that, and buy this one too. Uh, Dominaire Courtier Courtier are amazing. Now, the other two games in the Tempest series, the... Um, the uh, uh, 
Canalis and Mercante, they were both good. I enjoyed them, but to me, they don't hold a candle to uh, Cordier and Dominaire, especially Dominaire. Um, love this game. Once again, friends, buy it. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us again on The Discriminating Gamer. As always, we ask you to please leave a comment for us on YouTube, on Board Game Geek, on our Facebook page, or on thediscriminatinggamer.com. We ask you to please like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and follow us on Twitter. We are The Discriminating Gamer, ladies and gentlemen, and remember, if you want to get ahead, it's not who you know, it's who I know. Please somebody help me on my feet again, and I don't know where I'm going, and I don't know where I've been. Please somebody help me on the solid ground. Thanks, Zach. You know, Zach just told me you made all that up about Congress and the Constitution. You're not my king! Cut the song! Cut the song!